Uh, so welcome everybody to the 20th episode. We're big boys now, Mark, um, of the Art of Art of Law. Uh, this episode is, of course, everything woofy. And uh, I sent a couple emails out to uh, on the invitations and just gauge if, you know, if people had questions. And uh, I think to our surprise, uh, we received a lot of feedback. So, um, which is good because uh, this type of, this is the type of, I guess, engagement that we're looking for. But for people who are new, uh, this series of, uh, this series of webinars, I guess you could say, is just about uh, Mark's experience uh, practicing in China from, you know, 15 years ago when he wrote the, uh, the, the China Art of Law book uh, till today. And everyone that is uh, in, that is registered on the Eventbrite website will receive a, a copy of this presentation. And in that copy, you can click the link here and it'll take you to our YouTube page where you can find a recording of this and the previous episodes. Um, as always, if I, I assume that this episode is going to generate quite a bit of questions just because it is, maybe, I don't know why we haven't thought of this earlier, Mark, maybe it's because we just assume that this is something that is so fundamental and we kind of just overlooked it for a long time, but I'm sure people will have, yeah. That boring a topic. <laughs> as we as we like to do before we actually kick off, uh, we like to talk a little bit about the past and, um, you know, today. And I, Mark, I don't think you've seen this in a while, but in the chapter of your book, which I have here, um, yes. you, you had a, chapter on woofies and I'd be interested to, you know, a couple questions later on in the presentation, we'll just gauge your interest on, you know, how woofies were back then and, you know, versus today, I'm sure a lot has changed, but um, this was at the end of every chapter in your book, you have a, a, a quiz and uh, I don't think we'll go through the quiz after the, after this presentation, but here, here is the uh, quiz for those playing at home. If you, want to uh you know take it yourself after this presentation is done yeah. well the Mark. book you know when i did the book they 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 there were a few reviews and one person was very positive it was actually tim lamb uh, before i knew him uh, and he was very positive but he was very negative about the quizzes which i thought were hilarious and he just said it was like childish and immature so yeah i don't know uh, where do you fall down uh, on this sean do you find them amusing or childish and immature the quizzes well, I like the first one um, because for a long time I didn't, I, I also didn't know how to pronounce it correctly. And um, yeah. I just like WFOE like YMCA. <laughs> but <laughs> there are chapters of the book where the, the quizzes are, I would say, I agree with Tim <laughs> about. Okay. Uh, okay, everyone's a crazy. Okay. You wrote these yourself, right? Or is this a ghostwriter? Yeah, sure. so who else is going to write it? <laughs> All right, so um, so like I said, we received a lot of questions on um, on on just a breadth of different topics on woofies. But I guess first, before we jump into that, Mark, maybe we just go over just what is a woofie generally before we get into some of the more um, detailed questions. So, yeah, yeah. So I think yeah uh, here yeah the woofie yeah. So I mean, what is it? I mean, it's really just a wholly foreign owned enterprise. I think when we first started out in the early 90s, there were very few woofies. And it was also because people thought you had to have um, uh, be either export orientated, which means you have to export more than 70% from memory, or very high tech. <laughs> and so most people were thinking they have to do a joint venture in China. And so that was very common. We used to do a lot of rep offices as well, where a rep office really um, is not a uh, separate legal entity. It just represents its uh, parent company. Uh, it can't, you know, sign contracts. It can't do invoicing, you know, etc. We do very few now. We only do rep offices if it's something like an insurance company or someone very restricted or an NGO. You know, so that's where we see rep offices. Um, and then I think, you know, if we just look at how we compare them, you know, high cost, most difficult. You know, probably the joint venture is the most difficult or the most demanding and you know, can have a lot of high cost. I think a woofie over time has become simpler and easier. And I think really it's what used to be rep offices now are trading woofies or consulting woofies. 
just because really the cost isn't very different anymore and it just has a lot more scope. And I think, you know, a lot of people are talking about, you know, not services, uh, but we're talking about people doing products or something or trading. You know, cross-border e-commerce is also very common and that will be you know, sometimes a bit more expensive even, uh, but that's what people do. And then I think people who are really hands-off might just, you know, do distribution or they might just export to Chinese uh, traders and they just sell the stuff. Yeah. And any experience, yeah. you, a lot of clients, uh, you know, move throughout this chart here. Like, do they start off, you know, with just a distributor, then move to cross-border e-commerce, then to Wolfies, then to JVs? Or, you know, what's your experience with that? Well, I think it depends. I mean, it's, it's all very bespoke, but I would guess um, few people do the first thing in China with a joint venture. I think that's a, a relatively rare thing. I mean, it's possible. But if you look at the you know more traditional companies, you know if we're talking about products rather than services, uh, especially if we're talking about B two B type products, I think it's always been the case that people would start to export, they would distribute. If you look at the auto sector, you know a lot of it was when the big automotive manufacturing companies set up their joint ventures in China, because back then there was also all those local content uh, push. Uh, then a lot of those European and American suppliers, they were kind of forced by the OEMs to set up um, you know, their own local manufacturing. So I think it's mostly you sell to China, you see there's a market in China, and then you decide to set up a manufacturing entity or a trading entity in China. And so I think you know for, for most companies now, unless they really know the joint venture partner well, or they're required in some cases still to need a joint venture partner, or they uh, see the joint venture partners being very strong, you know, then that's possible. But I think for most people, if they've got the market, they'll set up a woofy rather than a joint venture. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this is a flow chart of the woofy uh, establishment process, which looks pretty clean now. Um, uh, uh, the name pre-registration straight about into the lease, into the uh, MOFCOM filing and the uh, registration the actual business to get the business license. And then the post-registration matters. Um, I, I, I assume that if people who are looking into setting up a Woofie or have a Woofie are pretty familiar, I guess, with something like this. But I guess, oh, since we have you here, Mark, you know, was it, was it always this way? Uh, it was always, it used to be a little bit more tough, but I think Woofies, since like maybe 1998, they were always pretty easy. Yeah, of course, it would depend on the level of authority. So, you know, in the old days, people, uh, I think it was like 30 million US dollars, you'd have to go to provincial level, 100 million US dollars, you'd have to go to the state council. And so, you know, we did have some projects, like big companies doing like a, like one was doing like a terminal for um, grain or something, they actually split it up into, you know, three companies all under 30 million just to avoid the higher level uh, authorities, etc. Uh, so uh, I think nowadays it's, it's more easy. I think this is always the same, but it would have been in the old days a MOFCOM approval rather than a filing. Now it's only approval if it's on the negative list. And it used to be prescriptive what you could do as a woofie, and now it's rather what you can't do as a woofie. Uh, but I think this is pretty much a similar, yeah. You know, the the conceptually it's not different, and I don't think it's been difficult. What's difficult for a woofie actually isn't on here. Uh, so yeah, you know, this is a bit too simplistic. One thing, if you were doing a manufacturing woofie, the most complicated thing is probably the. Um, um, uh, uh, environmental impact assessment. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that can take time. Uh, so that that we should put that in there somewhere. Actually, going forward. Yeah, I think this was a yeah, this yeah. Was pretty uh, the skeleton. It's of, probably uh, for a trading company or a consulting yeah. company. All right, but um, how long do you think it takes now to set up a Wolfie? I think in reality, you know, uh, we got a client at the moment and. Three weeks ago, they said, look, it's urgent. We must move. And uh, we said, I will, you know, this is a kind of Tuesday. And we said, I will send you a, um, 
a questionnaire and raise some issues. So their main issues was they didn't have a lease. They didn't think they wanted the lease. They wanted everyone to work from home and they didn't have uh, a Chinese name for their company. And anyway, and they said they want to do things immediately. And now it's three weeks later, we've, you know, emailed them twice or whatever. They haven't returned the questionnaire. They, when they got our questions, they immediately demanded on the next day a call to discuss the issues. We got on the call. And so, you know, the questionnaire is not very complicated. It's just like, you know, a bit about their company, about where they want to set up and all this stuff. So I think if you had somebody who really wanted to get things done quickly, I think six weeks you can get it all set up. Uh, I think in reality, because there's always screwing around with the lease, screwing around with the different Chinese names, and then just, you know, working out who's going to be on the board or the executive director, I think it takes two months up to five months. But most yeah. of that time yeah. is really due to the... Uh, client not the uh, uh, authorities sometimes the law firm, but it's never the authorities i don't think they care they just have a process and they do it pretty quick now well i think uh point to the next slide here i think a lot of uh clients when they read the questionnaire and they start to learn a little bit more about what the woofy is you know questions just lead to more questions and so you know we had that chart in the in the in the beginning that you know highlighted the uh the cost and difficulty and those types of things. But with that, uh, you know, with setting up a Woofy, there are certain benefits that you have versus, you know, just doing cross-border e-commerce or a wrap office or, you know, something, or just having a Chinese distributor. So we listed here some of the benefits of actually having a legal entity in China. So Mark, do you want to just go over these real quick? Yeah, so I think, you know, there are, you know, there are still people who somehow think, they can operate remotely in China, a real business without being here, which has permanent establishment risks. But okay, you'd have to be really big to really get bitten on that. But yeah, it's not a compliant practice. Uh, we had some NGO clients who've had problems with that, actually. So you can get bitten by that. But that wasn't the uh, tax issue. It was just rather, you know, the PSB saying, what are you guys up to? You know, what are you doing? <laughs> so, you know, I think there's that issue. If you're onshore in China, we have other clients who still say, can't we operate the business from Hong Kong? You know, like, uh, but really, you know, they want to do business in China. They want to like sell and trade in China. They want to like do, you know, maintenance calls. They, they really want to have a physical presence in China, but they still think that can't we just do it from Hong Kong? Why do we need an entity in China? You know, we can do it all via Hong Kong. So I think that's one benefit is you can have an office, you can have people working for you, you can have a telephone a few people still use telephones or whatever yeah it means you actually are onshore in china uh you can conduct business in china you can sign contracts you're also protected from limited liability i guess that might be also kind of important you can directly hire local staff i guess that's you know comparing it to a rep office uh rep offices can't but yeah it's not a big difference you know you can just hire people via fesco that's not really that difficult either and then you can, you know, receive payment and RMB and transfer funds to other currencies. So I think that's one of the bigger ones. We have, you know, a few clients who are uh, services or software companies. And yeah, it's pretty amazing. They have quite big business in China, but they're operating fully offshore. And that really makes it difficult. You must really love the product because firstly, Chinese you know, citizens are subject to uh, restrictions on how much um, foreign exchange they can spend in a year offshore. And also, you know, if you're working in a company, yeah, those kind of invoices are difficult to, you know, reconcile in your accounts. So I think those SAS companies, when they set up a woofy in China and they start using Chinese distributors if they don't want to go to the hassle of getting their own VATS licenses, they see a very quick, big bump in their revenues. Mm -hmm. So that is really, and that's for anybody who's a service provider, like, you know, early on, the law firms, were also a strange type of rep office. And early, early on, back in the early 90s, uh, the law firm couldn't receive the, uh, the money because it was that kind of invoice. Uh, so that kind of rep office, you couldn't receive funds. And there was only later that the law firms, even though they were rep offices, could receive RMB payment. And that made things much easier because you know if you're working for I don't know, Siemens or something, Siemens Germany doesn't really want to pay for Siemens China. You know, they're the same uh, group 
but you know it's not like you know people want to pay somebody else's expenses so yeah i think it's important if you're transacting in china that you can receive payment rmb and then far pls i guess everybody knows that invoices it's difficult to get reimbursed if you're a chinese person from a company if you don't have a far pl yeah, yeah. <coughs> and so uh after this slide, we'll get to the viewer questions because we do have a lot, but uh, I guess this is, and, and actually some of the viewer questions were, were about registered capital. I think that a lot of, of even uh, people who have been in China and have Wolfies uh, are still a little bit um, confused about registered capital. You're talking about Fred. Are you talking about Fred? Uh, Fred and others actually. Yeah, Fred asked and, this question yesterday. <laughs> yeah. We're not going to say Fred's second name, but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, there was, was there was there was a, there was more than one actually, and I, I yeah. think uh, this is something that I think is uh, probably one of the first you know things that catches someone's eye when they're filling out that questionnaire. They're thinking about you know setting up a Wolfius. What is this registered capital? Because they probably have not heard of this concept before. So, yeah, Mark, mm. I, I give the floor to you. Okay, thanks. So, so I think rents the capital is like shareholder equity, and it used to be early on in the old days. Uh, somehow it became there was I don't think there was ever a law saying exactly what the minimum rents the capital was, but the policy was uh, for any woofy anywhere that I'd ever done one, it was always total investment of two hundred thousand US dollars and a registered capital of one hundred forty thousand, and then it was either two years or if you were in Shanghai they would say, you have to pay it in within six months. Now, I think the registered capital, it's no minimum, um, you know, and also there's, you only have to commit to pay it in, you know, before the expiry of the company. So I think when you look at the registered capital, uh, this is money you actually have to commit in. Um, and so we got lots of stories about this, actually, even though it's a boring topic, it kind of does cause real issues. So we had a client, which was a German company. And, um, you know, I had told them that for that trading company, uh, uh, they needed to have a minimum of 140,000. And, you know, the thing which I always say to people is be conservative, uh, but have enough money that the company will be able to go. And you can always top it up with other things like a marketing agreement or a, a service agreement or a loan or increase registered capital. The problem with registered capital is it's really almost impossible to decrease the registered capital. We've done it once and it's very difficult. So you've got to get the creditors to agree. And also the authorities don't like it because it reduces their statistics for you know, uh, investment. So it's very difficult. So it's better to be conservative. Uh, anyway, so that German company, you know, they had asked lots of questions, 140,000. Anyway, I get a call from them, you know, like all excited. The bank has rejected our, you know, investment. And I said, why? And they said, oh, well, you know, we sent it and they just rejected it. And I said, well, send us the transfer. And so the transfer was not for 140,000 US, it was 2 million euros. And I said, well, why is that? And they just said, oh, well, we think we need that much money. I said, well, you need to change the thing because these are all, you know, linked the, you know, because the capital, the registered capital goes on the capital account. Loans go on the capital account. Capital accounts tightly regulated, current account, not so much. So I think when we're talking to companies at the moment, and people say, how much registered capital do I need? You know, I'd say, well, it's up to you. you know, the best answer would be conservatively until the company you think can make break even. You know, but uh, that's the first step. Uh, it has to be registered, the registered capital has to be fully contributed. And I think here we've seen in the last two years at least four cases where people either didn't know or didn't care. And the people who were running around locally were really putting their company at a big risk. So one company was an automotive company uh, setting up something in Nanjing. And the local guy who was their China uh, sales uh, director, whatever, he was running around and um, you know, it came back in the investment agreement that the Nanjing government was going to give them all this money. But there was in the agreement a very clear thing stating that, you know, you'd have to put in 30 million US dollars. And this company didn't need to put in 1 million US dollars for that, that business. And anyway, this was really, it kind of actually even broke the relationship between us and the client. 
because we kept on saying, you know, it says that in this investment agreement, and it even says mm -hmm. you will not get the 20 million renminbi in subsidy until you've put in cash 3 million US dollars. And I said, but we're never going to put in that money. I said, but this is what it says. And they said, oh, we talked to our guy. He says, it's just on the paper, don't worry. And of course, very often, of course, Nanjing would rather have a company with, you know, 30 million uh, registered capital than this. Uh, it happened again, you know, two days ago. We've got a client who wants to set up an online e-commerce platform. We found someone who's set up one recently in Waigao Chow that has that same kind of license that we want to get. And, you know, based on our research, I think it was like 1 million renminbi registered capital to get that kind of license. But this American company has put in 100 million registered capital. There's absolutely no reason why they would do it. It just makes no sense. So people often make a mistake or they're influenced by the local authority saying, oh, we really would like it. But yeah, there's no free lunch. I mean, you can't just write 100 million <coughs> renminbi. You're not going to collect money unless you revenue, uh, generate the tax revenues or actually put in your own cash. Yeah, it's not that easy. So if, if, uh, if decreasing the registered capital is difficult, maybe even impossible, uh, what, is there any benefit to having a, for example, 5 million uh, capital versus a 1 million capital? I don't think so. I think, uh, I think yeah, you don't want the, ha I mean, you just have to balance something. You have to put the money in. So let's say if you think it's a million and then your expenses, and then most people would say, let's top it up with 15% contingency or whatever. Yeah, but you wouldn't like say five, because yeah, you have to balance the hassle of going back and doing a simple amendment to the articles and getting approval and change the business license. Yeah, this will probably take six weeks, but it's not expensive. It's not complicated and it will be approved. So, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. Uh, but that's better than saying a hundred million. God knows what they're going to happen when they want to close that company, and uh, the Chinese will say, "Well, you have to put the money in before you can close it." Yeah, um, this is kind of a, like you said, Mark. I think there's a lot more to this topic. So, if you have any questions about this, just put in the chat. But for the sake of uh, time, I I like to just move on. So, um, you know, when I was putting together all of the responses to the the, the invitation email, uh, it it started pouring in. And I originally had uh, another section on, um, I guess, uh, board and director uh, duties and uh, a little bit about leases. And they're still here, but they're towards the end. But um, I would like to spend this next uh, section just getting to all of the viewer questions that, uh, that we received. And if you have- What are the yellow lines? What do they mean, these yellow lines, Sean? No. Which yellow line? Oh, which yellow lines? I see two yellow lines around the phone. Oh. I don't see anything. Oh, really? That's weird. Okay. All right. So see them everywhere. I kind of um, broke this down into uh, um, uh, different different sections. I try to categorize these questions, but um, I guess this one I didn't write it here. But this one is more about uh, board and management structure. So, uh, oh, all right. I'll have to go back and look at the for the other lines, but. Um, uh, this this slide, yeah, that Mark. guy, that guy in that movie, like Bruce Willis in that movie, The Sixth Sense or whatever. I see dead people. I see yellow lines everywhere. <laughs> no, I'm just missing a sense, probably. <laughs> All right, so um, uh, maybe Mark. I think one of the other things that a lot of people get hung up on, in addition to like the register capital, is about uh, board and management structure. Um, so. Uh, I, I originally had this, yeah, it gets a little bit complicated. So originally I had this slide here because uh, uh, there are different roles for setting up a WOFI. And Mark, maybe you can just talk a little bit about these roles uh, that, uh, for yeah. setting up. Yeah, so I would put the supervisors at the bottom, actually, because this makes it look like they are in charge. And a supervisor <laughs> doesn't do anything. So I think, you know, I'm even a supervisor of a few companies which just shows you how little they do. So uh, I think a supervisor, the only role is uh, they can represent the investor if the board and the management conspire against their interests, because otherwise, how would you take action? Because you know, the uh, company is run by the board. Uh, and then I think what we've got is 
at the board of directors, I'd say 70, no more, probably 80% of companies, Woofies, 80% of Woofies probably have a board. You could also have an executive director. Um, executive directors have only ever really seen if the company that is setting it up is also really fully owned or majority owned by an individual. And this person likes to be in charge of everything. Uh, and then if we have a woofy, I honestly reckon, I can't remember a, a wholly foreign owned enterprise that didn't have three directors. I think it's always three. You know, you, you, know you, you can't have two. The minimum is three. I think the maximum is 13 from memory. But uh, yeah, almost everybody has three. And then you have um, the legal representative in a joint venture, it has to be the chairman, but in a um, woofy, the legal rep can be either the chairman or the general manager. Okay. All right. Great. So I'll go back to this uh, section. So um, some of the questions that we received from the, the, the viewers here, um, you know, which of these roles, because I, I, uh, a, a lot of these people are, uh, you know, international, maybe they are in China, maybe they aren't in China. So out of those uh, those roles, Mark, are there any requirements based on, you know, do they have to be in China? Do they have to be Chinese? You know, are these, uh, are there any requirements? So China has no nationality or um, residency requirements. So uh, I would say most of our boards would have like three directors who are based offshore. So, you know, the board, the Wuffy, you know, it's um, it's and most of those people are not Chinese nationals, so I think that's it. I think with general managers, sometimes for an initial period, uh, but I think it would be strange in the long term if the general manager isn't somebody in China. So that can be um, you know a Chinese national or an expat or something like that. So that's normal. Um, I think where we see some overlap is some companies like to have the general manager also as a director in the board. I don't think it's that good. Um, you know, I also think um, the legal rep can be a general manager. I also don't think that's that, that good. You know, uh, it gives perhaps too much leverage to the general manager, makes it harder to remove them. Um, you know, there was that big case, we weren't involved, but ARM, which was I think SoftBank and an English UK company and a Chinese company, had a general manager went crazy with his chops and just couldn't get rid of the bugger. So I think, you know, it's not good to have the general manager as the legal rep, especially if they're running the business locally. Uh, board versus sole director. I think it's it would be a bit weird if the company is like a big company that they would not, I think sole directors only make sense if it really is the owner of the company has tight control over things. Liabilities. Look, long story is there's like a four page memo one can write about it. But I think, you know, first thing is normally in China, the company will be responsible for any of these liabilities. Secondly, it will be only the directors if they were involved in it. And thirdly, you have to really do something pretty bad for, you know, directors to be, uh, you know, personally liable. The legal representative is more liable than the others. But I think my feeling is over time, this is mostly if it is something which is considered very sensitive. So it would be like, you know, I remember once we had a joint venture in a dynamite company and uh, yeah, there the legal rep, you know, the local authorities just said, the legal rep has to be Chinese national. We said, well, that's not the law, blah, blah, blah. They said, yeah, we don't care if it's the law or not, but if something blows up and there's a hundred people dead, we want to be able to grab the legal rep. And so then the uh, foreign clients said very quickly, yeah, I think we can give that up. Okay, we'll let the Chinese side be the legal rep. So yeah, and we had another case with gas cylinders in the South where a gas cylinder exploded and the legal rep, he wasn't arrested, but he was taken you know, into custody for discussions. Or something. So I think the legal rep is the person, if there is a big crisis, and that might be a reason why it's good to have him overseas to do it. Then d &O insurance, it exists in China. I don't know how good it is. I've never seen anybody rely upon it, but I think it's quite limited in benefit because I think d &O insurance wouldn't cover criminal acts. And I think if you haven't done anything criminal or very grossly negligent, you're probably not liable. But I can understand if you're a director, you wouldn't mind the company to you know, have it. 
Yeah. And then the power of attorney, I think um, we often have a mandatory bylaws. Um, you know, uh, it's not a reason to be legal rep because you want to be a bank signatory. You know, the banks will have their own requirements, but typically there's a board resolution and a signature of the legal rep, and they authorize, you know, one or two people in the company in certain ways. Good, Mark. So this is the, the next one. I guess this is uh, what we were, uh, this is why we went over uh, the, you know, what, what is a, a Wolfie generally. And so um, this group of questions is more about planning, I guess, uh, when you um, maybe just to start off is when do you, when should one start to even think about uh, exploring Wolfie as an option compared to, for example, a rep office or, you know, uh, just doing cross-border e-commerce or one of those, one of those other options. Yeah. So I think firstly, we should say that photo is making me a bit distressed because these people show absolutely no regard for social distancing. So, uh, yeah, this is a bit shocking. I mean, they're only sharing two screens. I don't even know, like the two women are looking at the same screen. It's just very strange. But anyway, um, yeah. So when should you start thinking about a Wolfie, I mean, I think it really depends. Some people do start with a Woofie as part of their market entry. Um, but I think really for most people, you, for most types of companies as well, it's probably wise to see if you can do some exports, if you're able to get a bit of market presence. Uh, but a Woofie is also not a massive investment. So I think, um, you know, if it was a cosmetics company, you might first test the market to see if there's a distributor who's interested or if there's an online demand for your product or is it already being sold, you know, before you set up. So I think for most people, yeah, it would be a little bit curious if they set up a Woofie and they had no China business. I think that would be unusual. Uh, preferential treatment, you know, there are very big differences. You know, I was a bit surprised. I thought everybody would promise the same stuff. But we, we got this, the one which we did last week was for this e-commerce platform. And, you know, a lot of the other districts in Shanghai were very keen and they had a lot of uh, preferential treatments, but they were quite different. And, you know, let's say it was Huang Pu, which was kind of striking. Huang Pu's preferential treatment was mostly about talents, you know, like uh, tax relief for the talents, et cetera. And I think that's because Huang Pu's got like... Uh, a lot of the universities, like 10 or 15 of the main universities in Shanghai are based in Wangpu. And so that was interesting, but they couldn't really compete uh, on e-commerce preferential treatment with the Waigao Chow in Shanghai because they were all about, you know, sales, revenue, subsidies based on VAT and things like that. So yeah, you have to look around a bit. <clears throat> so that's for an e-commerce platform. And the Beijing guys, we talked a few of their districts, Theirs were all the same. They weren't tailored and they weren't very exciting. So it's interesting. And so I think preferential treatments probably are mostly around Shanghai and Nanjing. And so if you were like an autonomous car driving type of company, like a chip company, uh, you'd have all kinds of people chasing you. You know, there'd be a lot of excitement um, and you'd have like Nanjing, you know, uh, Tongli, you'd have Suzhou, no doubt. You'd have lots and lots of different uh, zones looking. I mean, free rental would be no problem, I think. You know, it's easy to get. Uh, but there would be also people that are willing to put in money. If you put in money, they might even help you raise capital with local PE firms. So I think, you know, 10 years ago, it wasn't such an issue. I think nowadays, it's kind of interesting, the preferential treatment. And also, the ones who are in the Yangtze Delta, I don't know about Shenzhen that much, uh, how that works. But in the Yangtze Delta, you do see clusters. So, <clears throat> you know, they tailor it for certain types of businesses. And so it probably is even better for you to be there because a lot of your suppliers or similar companies will be there. That can also be an advantage. So that's why I think preferential treatment is really interesting to look at. And one of the preferential treatments actually, which the Waigao Chao would offer for this um, latest e-commerce uh, e type company is they have a history of issuing these licenses. Other zones have a history of promising the licenses but not issuing them. So Waigao Chao actually has issued the license that the client needs. Yeah. And uh, maybe the last, the last bullet point here, Mark, about business scope, because this, this was also um, 
kind of, uh, I guess, a uh, tertiary issue that uh, a lot of companies get caught up on is um, how, how the application for the Wolfie, you know, requires kind of a, um, uh, I guess, tight, but at the same time, you want to keep it as general as possible business scope section, so. Yeah, so I think uh, the business scope, it's, um, yeah, it's, I think with a wholly foreign enterprise, it's not so difficult. Um, I think you've got to draft it in a wide way. Since it's a wholly foreign enterprise, you're not like worried about exclusivity from the joint venture partner or something. So you, know, you should do it relatively wide, uh, and, but detailed enough to rely on it. And I think people get hung on, on it too much. And um, you have to avoid certain terms. Like if you put in education, you might trigger something and these things. And I remember this was a while back, but a German company wanted to set up and we put together a good proposal. And I can't remember what their business scope was, but their business scope, I said, well, you can't do that or that. So you could do this kind of wording and we've had someone else get a similar wording approved. Anyway, they wrote back to me and they said, oh, you know, Mr. Schaub, we just got this new thing. You know, we, we did like your proposal but we went with this other law firm because you know they were able to get the business scope that we wanted. I thought there's no bloody way they got that business scope because it's just very clear you could not have it. I can't remember what it was. But anyway, I said, well, oh, that's interesting. Can you send us the business license? And they sent us the business license. And of course the business scope was totally different. It was just the most vanilla trading company business uh, scope ever. So it didn't even have the nuance that we wanted to bring in. And uh, you know, so I told them that and uh, they were a little bit disappointed, you know. And in another case we had was somebody wanted to make a book out of the business scope and they're normally quite long, but boy, they wanted to put in everything. And anyway, the Chinese authority said, no, we can't do it. And we kept on talking about it. Said, oh, they really want it. And they said, look, we can't do it because we have to use a certain font in the business license and this won't fit in. And they said, look, if you, if you just insist on having it, then what will happen is we're just going to shorten it and you won't know what's short until you see the business license. <laughs> so, you know, it's those kind of things you have to think about. And oh, maybe you, know, should, so maybe you need should. to have a kind of specific business scope. Nowadays, they will often refer to things like if you need an operational mm -hmm. license or subject to that. And you can edit your business scope later, but very often it might require you to put in additional investment because they always love additional investment. So if you say, I want to start making bicycles and then you say later, I want to start making motorbikes, you know, it's going to be a bit of a process to get that, you know, you know edited. So the trick there is to try to be as flexible as possible, but detailed enough to, um, you know, really yeah. nail it down. And avoid like trigger, you know, like if you had something like a company that wants to monitor, you know, financial investments, or whatever, but you wouldn't put in financial investments or giving uh, investment advice to Chinese because uh, citizens, because that's all very, you know, hot button, yeah, even like, English language training, I think, has also been a hot button. We had a problem with that like a couple of years ago. So you have to be careful that, you know, you don't over make it complicated or trigger something. All right. So uh, this one was, um, I, I, I grouped these two questions together as part of a structure uh, section. So uh, one of the questions was about reclassifying an existing business uh, to a Wolfie. I don't know uh, what was the existing business already. Maybe it might have been a, um, maybe it was a cross-border e-commerce business. I, I'm not sure. But um, is it possible to convert a, a company in, in China to a Wolfie and then also getting, and then, you know, unleashing all the uh, benefits that we put uh, in the previous slide, you know, the benefits of having a Wolfie? Yeah. So I think you can't unleash a, a rep office. So that, maybe that was the question. Some people think they can turn the rep office into a Woofie. That, that can't happen. You just set it up. Um, you know, the only other kind of company you would have would be a Chinese domestically owned company. And that's pretty simple. As long as, you know, the business uh, is okay for Chinese foreign investment, that's just a simple M&A deal. And, you know, we have a strong preference. I think we've done a thing on it before. You know, share deals are much easier than asset deals. So, you know, basically you buy 100% of the um, company and it ends up being a woofy. So uh, it's pretty easy. But if it was, uh, if it, so if it was the other way, would you just have to close everything down and then open up again? Uh, uh, what other way? 
sorry, if 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 uh, if you wanted to, uh, if you had a rep office and you wanted to change into a Woofie, you would just shut it down and then, or you know, uh, no, you would like what you would do is you would set up the Woofie and then you'd close the rep office because uh, closing a rep office is, I think, more stressful than closing a bloody uh, Woofie. It's a uh, it's one of the most uh, annoying uh, things. It just never is a never-ending hassle. So, uh, you know, you wouldn't want to have that break. So I think you would set up the woofy, move the people to the woofy, and then at your leisure, close down the rep office. Okay. And uh, earlier on, you mentioned about having this uh, uh, people wanting to work out of Hong Kong, or maybe even uh, some company structures have a Hong Kong inter intermediary, uh, kind of like a holding company. Uh, you know, is that necessary? And if, if not, are, what are the, the pros and cons of having one of these uh, holding companies? So I think, you know, really, I think firstly, there's the tax kind of benefit, because Hong Kong has a better tax arrangement than most Western companies. So uh, you know, if you've got technology license or dividends or whatever, there'll be a 10% withholding tax in China. If it's a Hong Kong business with some substance, it's 5%. So I think that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is, you know, it can be a bit of a shield, you know, um, there any problems at the Hong Kong level, not perhaps at the UK or American or German level. So that can be an advantage. Um, and then I think, you know, maybe Hong Kong or Singapore, you know, um, a lot of people now, I think more often they use Singapore than Hong Kong. If it's a big like US company, they might have like a regional kind of headquarters in Singapore or Hong Kong, and they'll put all the business and acquisitions under that vehicle. Uh, and you know, that might be some kind of advantage from a management perspective. And then I think the final one would be if it was a business that you thought might spin off at some stage, that maybe the China business, you know, maybe you're a a tech kind of startup, you know, but more, you're like a, uh, like a unicorn or something. You could imagine that your core market might go in one direction and maybe China and Southeast Asia go in another market. And then if you had it all in a Hong Kong intermediary, you wouldn't have to carve it all out. You could just like list the Hong Kong company or Singapore company or sell it off or you know, introduce investors into that company rather into the top code, which would you know, complicate things. So I think for most companies, it's not a big mover of the dial, but for some, it would be important. And I guess the uh, yes. response would be that you, I've, I've heard you mention this before, if you do have a Hong Kong holding company or you know business there, it, it has to be a little bit more than just a desk and a phone. Well, you need to have uh, some materiality to, benefit from the tax advantages, but for the other advantages, it doesn't matter. But yeah, you know, if you're just a family owned company making, you know, um, socks or something or whatever, yeah, there's no reason to have that extra layer of complexity, extra layer of cost. But if you're like a company that might list it or do something, then it would be much cheaper to set it up early rather than, you know, restructure everything later. And uh, the last two here, um, one on finances and one on, I guess, post-establishment. Uh, I, I, a lot of the questions, Mark, uh, I would say, um, were also about the, fi the, the finances part. Um, dividends, repatriation of funds, and also interacting with authorities on how to transfer, you know, how to move monies. So maybe you can just give us some of your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I think the dividends, like and the other distributions to shareholders, yeah, really, I think in the whole time, there was only a period of uh, maybe five or six years ago where it was a little bit difficult. But I think, you know, we never came across any Chinese authority saying you can't remit the dividends. It was just during a, 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 a slight crunch in the foreign exchange where China still had the most foreign exchange in the world, but it was depleting a bit and, you know, things got a bit nervous. And so there were two internal policies, which I don't think were public, but one was um, you could only, I think you could not send more than 5 million US dollars in dividends in one shot. They would ask you to split it into tranches over a period of time. And also your bank had to be able to balance the foreign exchange. So if you were like a, 
powerful exporting part of China, like uh, Zhejiang, where they export probably much more than they import, you know, they, they would have a lot of foreign exchange. And so there was a little bit, people were asking questions. Some people had to you know, get their dividends paid in tranches. That's really the only time I've heard this. So I think the, the main problem is when people try to transfer funds overseas uh, is there's something funny going on, you know? So dividends are easy. You need a board resolution. You need an evidence that you've paid tax, evidence that you made profit, uh, evidence you paid tax on that profit. Then you get to send the money out. It's very simple. Uh, other funds, I guess what we're talking about, you know, if the Woofy buys parts from the mother company or, so, or the parent company, you know, that's just a supply contract. It's on the current account. It's very simple. Shareholder loans repayments, it's a bit more complicated because it's a capital item, so it needs to be registered. But if it's registered, no problem to pay it back, you know. Uh, they might look at the interest rates if it's like reasonable, but you know, not a big issue. Uh, if there's a service agreement, again, it might be a tax, there'll be a tax event, you have to pay tax on the service. Uh, as long as it's reasonable, it'll be okay uh, to do it. Um, so I think it's not as difficult. I think we really people misunderstand it. And it's people cutting corners or doing things which are shonky. And they think it affects everything. And now interacting with safe, I don't think you get to interact with SAFE anymore very much because it's mostly the banks. And so if you can get the documents and it all makes sense, you know, uh, they'll transfer it. It's more of a hassle than being in Hong Kong or, you know, being in America and you go online and you just transfer the money to wherever. Uh, but yeah, it's the banks who are supervised by SAFE, not the companies themselves, is my understanding. So all of those things that you about, uh, need to be documented um so uh when uh you know what type of evidence or what type of documents does the are, are the banks looking for i know you said that you know maybe a shareholder resolution or something but these type uh what does the normal type of uh routine look like when one goes to the bank to say i want to uh transfer funds to uh to pay for the parts or something or, you know something like that yeah i, I think um I think with the parts, I mean, we just, I mean, probably it would just be the contractor or whatever information there is. And I don't actually know about buying for the parts, but for dividends, it's clear. Like I just said, it's the showing that you made profit, showing that you made tax and showing the board resolution. With the license agreement, it'll be the same thing. The license agreement, tax has been withhold and it doesn't look ridiculous. I think, yeah, that's the issue. I'm not saying it's never a problem. You know, if you want to send... $10 million out or something, yeah, maybe the bank is nervous, they'll ask questions. But I think really, it's not a big issue. Uh, we rarely have people raise this issue now. People have other issues. They say, oh, you know, I've got this Chinese investor, he wants to invest $2 million in my company. You know, he says he can do it. And you say, oh, I don't think he can. Or, or Chinese person wants to buy a house, you know, in California or something. Yeah, these people have problems. But I think if you're talking about these kind of woofy like exchanges, yeah, it's not yeah. really rocket science. I think it's you know quite yeah. easy. And so um, this last group here on Pulse Establishment, um, uh, I, there were a, a few questions about employment. Um, how do I hire my first employee? And what about uh, part-time employment? How does having part-time employees, how does that work as well? Yeah. Oh, okay. Hire the first employee. I mean, it's pretty easy if you're a woofy. Uh, you just like sign a labor contract with them. Um, the problem is, you know, like I just said before, the guys who haven't responded to the questionnaire, they also, their heads were on fire that they had to hire this guy and we need to hire him today or tomorrow or whatever. And, you know, three weeks later, it seems like they obviously wasn't as urgent. And so sometimes people want to hire people in advance. And that's difficult because you don't have an entity. Um, yeah, there are these employment type agents like Fesco, et cetera, but I don't think they're so keen. I mean, I remember that we have managed to convince them, but the problem is if they hire the uh, uh, national, yeah, it's not that easy to terminate people. Okay, they've got a probation period, but it's also not easy for Fesco to chase the foreign company if they change their minds, because I think that's a weird thing. People often start for the woofy and then they just do nothing. You know, like we have a client, <laughs> A big company, they set up a woofy like a year and a half ago. They still haven't hired their first employee. You know, like, uh, 
don't know what they're doing. You know, it's uh, yeah, but they also were urgent. Yeah, I don't think they even set up a bank account yet. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Yeah, the companies also sometimes are not serious. But anyway, uh, on the part-time employment thing, if we've got the email from a person, yeah, maybe we can send some details because I know we've done this for somebody, but I can't remember to tell you the truth. I just don't remember. <laughs> Okay, I, you mentioned Fesco, and I guess this is the, the last part about this post establishment. You know, once you have your Woofy, and you need to get some administrative functions into your into your company, uh, maybe some like uh, a, accounting team or a legal team or HR mostly. And um, you know, what are the what are the pros and cons of hiring in house for these types of functions versus outsourcing? You know, like you said, Fesco. Yeah, I, I think you know. Uh, it's probably better not be too ambitious. I think, um, yeah, for employment, rule of thumb, I should actually look into it one day, but yeah, I would always, I always thought if you have less than 15 employees, you'd probably rather have the payroll and, um, you know, the uh, social contributions done by an employment agency, like a Woofie or something. Um, if you, uh, I think, you know, the accounting, if it's not a big business, it's probably safer for you to have an external accountant. You know, uh, it doesn't have to be the big four. They're very expensive and very difficult, I think, to deal with. But there's, you know, a lot of, um, uh, you know, local accounting firms or corporate services firms that offer these kind of uh, uh, benefits. And I think the margin that you would pay to them really is quite, you know, low. Uh, legal, I think it has to be quite a substantive business before you would take a lawyer in-house. Um, and yeah, the problem is for us as a law firm is in America, I think if a, a company gets to the size that they hire an in-house legal counsel, the legal counsel will actually develop more business for the law firms because they see their role as strategic and you know, controlling things and you know, causing more problems for everybody else. But in China, the in-house lawyer thinks he's the in-house lawyer and starts doing most of the legal work. So, uh, yeah, so it's a pity. It's a big cultural difference between America and China is uh, in-house legal actually reduces work for outside lawyers. Where I think in America, there's nothing better than having an in-house lawyer because you know, they start worrying about things that you know nobody else in the company would you know, think about. Yeah, delegating yeah. work. Yeah. So, um, I had a lot of uh, slides here on, um, you might have to save this for next time, Mark, about management structure. I know it's a little bit, um, we, we, we need to talk more about the legal rep. We need to talk about the company chop, uh, but maybe for the little time that we have left, just talk about leases because like you, um, I think I, the reason why I put this here and I've created a lot of these beautiful slides is because, uh, I, I think that, um, you know, given our very recent experience with that with that one company, um, you know, they they wanted it was so urgent to set up the company. But, you know, you need you need an office. You need you either you either need an office or you need like a, a, a manufacturing plant or something. And this type of um, that that requirement by itself is kind of a, you know, a process of in and of in and of itself. So um, maybe we just talk a very little bit about you know how exactly does one go about uh, you know picking a location, uh, negotiating with the landlord, and uh, you know finally getting uh, securing their their space so that they can move on and continue with uh, the the Woofy application process. Okay, uh, so I thought first, boy, what a boring topic, but but actually it's kind of, so I think with the location, I think it really depends on the type of company. So, you know, if you're a chemical company, you're going to probably have to nowadays set up in a chemical zone. Uh, otherwise, you're just going to be looking for trouble, you know, uh, five years from now, you're going to have all kinds of problems, you know. So I think you have to look at your business, the environmental impact if you're a manufacturer, we don't see that many manufacturers as we used to. So that's why it's not front of mind. You know, so we see many more people setting up service companies or consumer facing companies. Uh, but then I think like, let's say if you're a, you know, a cosmetic company, maybe you'd set up in Shanghai because you know, there's places that manufacture cosmetics, et cetera. And then I think with the location, 
you would look at the preferential treatment depending on the business. Then, like, you know, we had this recent case with an NGO. Uh, we thought it was best to set up in a certain uh, district of Shanghai because that district was really encouraging uh, NGOs. And so they were helping us deal with the PSB and with CCPIT and all that kind of stuff. So I think, you know, that's, you know, the special case. If you think your business is somehow special, then you have to think a bit about the location. Uh, and I think you're special if you're manufacturing or you've got some kind of restriction or you need some connection to state-owned enterprise or something, then you'd probably be in Beijing. But let's just say if you're a vanilla type consulting company or a trading company, and let's just say that you would like, yeah, where do most people go? They probably, if it's just like a vanilla type company, it'll be whoever they're thinking of hiring, they'll set up there. And that person is normally either in Shanghai, sometimes in Beijing, sometimes somewhere else. So I think most of it, and I don't think it's just because we're based in Shanghai, but I think Shanghai does have most of these kind of trading and consulting companies. And so then I think the question is within Shanghai, the districts, it used to be more difficult with tax and things like that, but I think that's easier now. But I would pick a district and not move away from it because it's a hassle to move the, the district. And you know, so uh, you'd have to look at your kind of business, see the kind of preferential treatment. And then I think with the leases, you know, people don't understand this, but you can't set up the company without having a lease or at least a letter of intent because otherwise you don't know where to set up. So I think, um, yeah, so the lease, you know, um, uh, yeah, people get bent out of shape about it a bit, but really, you know, there's some things in life you just can't negotiate. So we tell clients quite often, look, we can look at the lease, but once we see the landlord, we kind of know how much you've got scope to negotiate. And, you know, if it's a top landlord in Shanghai and you're not really so exciting, it's difficult because of the dynamic of the way they, uh, you know, uh, negotiate the lease. The person in charge of the lease can only change the commercial terms. They really can't change the legal terms. And if it's a hot building, there's normally uh, interest in the building. So if you can't move quickly, you will lose the building. So I think you can only really negotiate stuff like rental, deposit, rollover space and things like that. But yeah, negotiating what a force majeure clause is, it'll be a waste of time and legal money, I think, to do it. All right. And um, here we just put a little bit of uh, common legal issues that Mark, you already went over, but um, these are some of the things that will be included in the presentation uh, sent to you after this. Uh, we're, up, we're out of time, Mark, but uh, I just want to go through this very quickly. Um, and these are like you just said, these are some of the must haves versus nice to haves. And depending on where you are looking for this space, um, your leverage against the landlord, which probably isn't much, to be honest, uh, you, you might want to you know, start ticking some of the boxes on the nice to haves if you find yourself with a little bit more leverage than you, you know. Uh, than, than we think you might have. Um, well, it depends on the building. I mean, if it's a building yeah. that's like 80% empty, you break a lot of uh, yeah. leverage. But if it's like going into a new building and you're a small tenant, you know, maybe not with office spaces not so much, but what I always saw was in the retail clients, you know, they would have a process of 10 layers of discussion and any good space, unless you were really like Chanel or somebody that brought a lot, uh, you know, uh, uh, of uh, um, foot traffic, then, you know, they're, they're just, you know, like, who is this difficult foreigner, you know, like, just go away, you know, so I think that's the issue. Yeah, I mean, for, for our side, we see, like, uh, maybe, like, for restaurants, for example, this is, there. there's the required space is a little bit more than just a usual, you know, uh, uh, apparel store or something like that, like a you know a small a small shoe store or something like that, um, and uh, good space for those types of uh, that fit those requirements are definitely a lot tougher uh, if you're looking at Shanghai for example. But maybe um, you might want to start uh, ticking off these nice to haves if you are in a you know second or third tier city for example, or you're in one of those uh, um, empty malls like Mark Mark mentioned. Everybody, thanks a lot for the questions. Uh, 
Again, uh, this, this, this webinar will be uploaded to YouTube. Uh, I made a lot of pretty slides that I think we'll save for the next episode. Um, but you know, we wanted to make sure that we wanted to get through a lot of everything, Wolfie, but it seems like, I don't think we you know, covered uh, even half of it, Mark. So maybe we need to do a part two to this. Uh, I'll, and if you have any questions, oh um, yeah. So Bruno said that he didn't know that closing a, a rep office was so difficult. And you know, there are a lot of these corner cases that we need to get to. So maybe Marco, I'll see you around for part two. Yep, sure, sounds good. All right, thanks a lot, everybody. Take care.